Herb and I, Herb Alpert and I started the company in 62 and released um, a record called The Lonely Bull. And uh, Herb was the Tijuana Brass, even though there, we added people later for the show, but uh, Herb was planting all the horns. And in those days it was three track and he could get his horns have a tremendous sound. And he, he was a great trumpet player, he still is, you know. So uh, we had a success with that record and uh, uh, we kept putting out records and um, in 65 we started to sell some albums of his that were not connected to a single or if they were it was. But to sell albums for a small company was a great, great deal when singles were, did mostly whatever he, a uh, small label was interested in. So we didn't have a hit single, so to speak, till 1965 or six. And by that time, Herbie was on the road and the Tijuana Brass was a huge act here. And, uh, and then we were fortunate enough to sign uh, Sergio Mendez, Brazil 66. And they went out on the road together and it was a fantastic combination. And uh, I think it, it explained the label very well. And we were into this kind of music, and uh, I still feel very close to Brazilian music. Uh, for me, if the tempo stops there, I'm absolutely fine with it. And uh, Sergio has become a great friend. And um, so in the middle of 67, these groups were out on the road and doing great, and uh, we were doing fantastic. Uh, but in 67, I went to um, uh, Monterey Pop festival up in Monterey, California. And uh, I was, it was a tremendous concert that Lou Adler put together up there and uh, well known now. And uh, he had Janis Joplin and he had The Who and there was a Beatle or two floating around and uh, it was a great time and I couldn't help but notice we didn't have an act on the bill, you know. And uh, I was concerned because I knew that's where music was going. And uh, so it was about that time that I got a call from my old boss. Uh, his name was Marvin Kane, who I was very close to. Um, I had worked for him in New York. And uh, he called up and said, uh, do you want to sign Procol Harum? And I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, well, go to England and see David Platts and Denny Cordell and see if you can make a deal, you know, and uh, we did. And we got Pro Call after the great album, Way to Shade of Fail, and, but we still had great records from them and Gary Brooker and, and everybody was great. And uh, we sold some records with Pro Call Harem and then we met, had a deal with Denny for his other projects. Denny was a very attractive figure, you know, he had these anaconda boots and uh, fantastic guy. And um, with Chris Blackwell, who he eventually introduced me to, um, I used to plant my luggage when I arrived in London on, in Chris's house. And we'd literally go out and just see bands for the next week. And it was just a fantastic time. You know, London was just so wide open and so friendly and, uh, and all this great music was happening and uh, we were able to understand it a lot better. And fortunately I was able to get some acts and get, make some connections. And it was important for our company to do that because uh, I wanted to uh, get certainly into a rock and roll situation. And I'm proud to say that in uh, 1969 at Woodstock, I was able to stand on the stage with Joe Cocker. And that was just quite a thrill in front of 500,000 people. So um, you might say he was a great bridge to where we were going as a fully run label. Because I might say at that time also, uh, in 69, we, we were able to sign the Carpenters. So it was the Carpenters, and then we had Joe, and then we had Cat Stevens, and I think Carol King around the same time from uh, Lou's Ode label. And uh, we were rocking. It was great. Yeah. Down at the end was Jerry's office. So you, you were saying, Rita, that it was a very family-run studio, right? 
A and M was always like a family, and Jerry and and Herb were the greatest bosses to work for. Everybody was equal. Nobody was, no artist was treated better than any other artist, and we always had, uh, they had an open door policy that any time we wanted to come in and talk to them about music, about anything, you know, just if they're not in a meeting, they're available, and they always were. They were great. Is it a, was it a personal philosophy to to encourage that sort of uh, uh, that, that that sort of feeling in in the artists who came in that they could be them be themselves, perform their best, and that you would support them? Well, we were competing with uh, CBS and Warner Brothers, and uh, aside from Atlantic, you know, Ahmed was very active and. Uh, and the only way we could compete with these people, you know, uh, we couldn't outspend them, certainly, was uh, we, we made the artists as comfortable as we could. And uh, if you wanted money and you could, you know, you're already on, a, you know, people bidding for you, then um, you were gone. You know, we couldn't compete on that level, you know, but uh, we tried to be an artist label, you know, so... Um, the lot helped us in a lot of ways because everything was on that lot and everything sort of flowed around it. And uh, we used it and we also, our doors were always open. The artists could come in any time, ask us whatever questions about anything. So uh, if they didn't like a cover or if they didn't like a press release or, you know, come on in, you know. And we tell them that and we, we managed to sign some pretty amazing people with that philosophy. And I know her believed it, and I certainly did, and it was uh, our way of competing. And uh, we were different than any of the other record companies. And Jimmy Iovine said that, you know, because Jimmy was, uh, before he got this major deal, you know, with Interscope and Apple, and Jimmy worked with us from 85 to 90 at a and m and uh, he thought we were the first company to really make the artists come first. And it was interesting to hear him say that, and so uh, I, I believe that's what it was. You know, if it was that apparent to Jimmy, that's what we that's what we did. So uh, we would be working at night. We would have different people. I mean, the studios because Herb wanted to make them state of the uh, art studios. I mean, they were used by Bruce Springsteen, U uh, two, whatever, would come and record there, and uh, everybody had rooms to relax in and do whatever. And that's what we did. And we had the facility functioning for us because Herb's brother, Dave, ran the facility. And uh, all, the, all the people wanted to personalize an office. If they wanted to, you know, I could tell you hundreds of stories about employees and how they felt about where the window was and where they were and what it meant to them in the early 60s and 70s, you know. And Dave tried to accommodate everybody. And uh, that's what we had a budget for, you know. And, and as long as we had hit records, we could support it. And we managed to get our share of hit records. And big records, big artists. So, um, it was fun. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think, uh, unless there's anything you wish to add. No, uh, it's... Um, it's great, you know, we, uh, uh, the Carpenters were huge in England and uh, Derek Green, our managing director over there, used to say when he was signing an act, you should thank Richard and Karen because they're paying for this. 